I hope you have some background of splines, and please interrupt me if there's if I'm leaving out anything or anything's not clear. Uh, so uh, the idea about splines is you take a piecewise polynomial function to approximate a continuous function. That means you know the function at several values. Here we have the function value, the function known at n plus 1 values, uh, and the value of the function is f. And then we're trying to find a, a piecewise quadratic function that passes through those points. So we're looking at quadratic splines. So on each piece, on each interval, we have a quadratic function, a different quadratic function. So uh, on the first interval from x0 to x1, we have this first function. Oh, okay. No, I can't share my screen. All right. That's, I just forgot. That's all. Can I follow? Yeah. All right. Sorry. Thank you for letting me know. Where are we here? Uh, still haven't gotten completely into this. All right. So let's try this again. We're here. All right, are you seeing my screen? Yes. All right, wonderful. All right, so just to re recap, uh, splines, you have n plus 1 points and the values of the function at that point, and you're trying to find a piecewise quadratic function. So these are for quadratic splines. So here you see the first interval from x0 to x1, and I have the uh, quadratic. The subscript is 1 for the first interval, and then the second interval here. I'd like to make this disappear. I guess I click here. Okay. And, uh, okay. and then the second interval has subscript 2. The last interval, interval has subscript n. So if there are n plus 1 points, there's n intervals. You can, you can think about that, but n plus 1 points means there's going to be n intervals, right? So for each interval, there's three numbers, so you have three n equations. Right. Now, uh, you have, each interval has two n points, so on the left n point, you want it to be, uh, to agree with a function uh, at the left n, n point. So that's where you get this i minus 1. i minus 1 is the left endpoint, and then i is the right endpoint. And you can see that because here, let's say for the first interval, the index is 1, and the right endpoint is x1, and the left endpoint is x0. So, so in this case, i equals 1. So the right endpoint agrees with the subscript on the coefficients. Now, so far, we have two n equations for those two endpoints. Um, and uh, the, so, yeah, so that's fine. Because each interval has a right, in, right endpoint and a left endpoint. Then we want the derivative to be continuous. So we take the derivative of the function on each endpoint, not on each interval. And that's what um, uh, this is here. That's the derivative on the ith interval. This is the derivative on the i plus 1th interval, and that has to be equal to 0. Now you don't get two, you don't get two equations for each interval because, uh, because you have intervals joining. So you can think about that also. And you only get n minus 1 equations here. And then we talked about this last time, that we assume the first spline is linear, so a1 is 0. So we have three n equations. All right, so we may express these 3n equations in a 3n by 3n matrix. There's a correspondence between matrices and systems of equations. So the columns of the matrix will represent the different variables 
and the rows of the matrix correspond to the different equations. Right. So since we have uh, two n equations of this form, and then n minus one equations of this form, and then the last equation looks like this, so we're going to be building up our equation, our matrix in pieces. Right. So the way we'll arrange it is the first n columns will represent the variables a. Right? Those are the quadratic coefficients. First n columns. Second n columns will represent the variables b. Last n columns will represent the variables c. Right? So that's three n columns. Right? So when you create your matrix, you know what the size is. So you can create, well, we'll get there, okay, All right? And then we, so we can also make a correspondence between the rows and equations as follows. Okay. So the first n rows represent left endpoint equations. Second n rows represent the right endpoint equations. And then the last, and then the n minus one rows represent the continuous derivative equation. And then we have one more equation for the a1 equals zero. So you're going to have to use some function, something like uh, v stack, um, to uh, put this matrix together. You're going to basically create the matrix in several pieces and and stack the pieces together. So here's how you'll define your function: uh, e to the minus x cosine 10x squared. And here's how you'll define your points, the square root of j over 8, for j from 0 to 32, right? So you don't need to have a, um, you don't need to have evenly spaced points. So notice that this means that x runs from 0, when j equals 0, x is equal 0. And then when I have j equals 32, I'll have the square root of 4, which is 2. So my interval is for actually from 0 to 2. And that's the interval I have my function on. All right. All right. So, how is this code structured? Well, you'll have to initialize the vector of x values and the vector of f values at the beginning. Maybe I should just go ahead and open up a Jupyter notebook if I need to illustrate some things. Am I still there? Yes, sir. Okay, good. All right, so let's do a new one. And we will make this bigger. Maybe it should come up in a second. 200 is probably too big. Oops, about 90 is too small. Okay, this should be good. Okay. All right, so certainly you're going to want to import NumPy as NP. Now the first thing it said x, so let me just try some x so I can say uh, x equals, now this is not what you would do, but you're going to do some kind of array. I'm just going to make an a range. Um, let's say, well, let's just do 16. Now notice that if you want to do a square root, you can just do something like this. this these are not the right numbers for x, uh, but I just put them in there. It is nice to put comments in your program. So here I would say uh, values of x, and then you can say uh, define function. And it's probably good to define your function as a function. So uh, def uh, fun, okay. So we'll have some fun, and I'll just do a simple uh, uh, function here. So we'll just do this. So I'll just say return uh, and he does. We'll just do something simple like that. So you'll want to be doing something similar to this. All right, so now you construct the matrix. All right. Now, say, here it says use a loop. Um, I typically use double letters for my loop indices. You don't have to. Uh, so what I say here is IIN range of n. 
So here I'm going to have to define n, of course. n is going to be the number of points in, in uh, well, let's see, I think it's n plus 1 is the number of points. n is the number of, of uh, n is the number of segments. So here I'd have to define n. Um, okay, so this would be the number of points. Oh, sorry. I don't want to do this in too much detail. Um, okay. right. So let's see what else we have here. So we'll have some kind of loop. Right. Um, so we're going to have to create the entries of the matrix and the entries of the vector. When you have a system of equations, it's the, uh, the coefficients are expressed in a matrix and the constants are expressed in a vector. Uh, well, I suppose if you haven't seen that, maybe I can show that quickly also, just for people who may not have that background. Uh, let's just go ahead and make a new one. So, for instance, if I have equations like um, 3x1 minus 7x2 equals 5 and 4x1 plus 2x2 equals 12, then you'd express this part as the coefficient matrix. So your Amex would be 3 minus 7, 4, 2, and then your B, B back would be equal to and 12. Okay. So you'll be doing something like that. Now you'll have to create your matrix as a vector of zeros, and then you'll have to create your vector as a 3n, 3n by 1 column vector of zeros. So you'll use the numpy.zeros function. All right. So when you construct the matrix, you can see that you're going to do three parts. Uh, well, all right, let's see how this, okay. okay. So here it says, uh, so in, in the first part, you create the first n, n rows and the first n, n values of BVEC. Second part, second n, third part, third n. And then the last row is just a singleton. Right. So once you have the matrix and the vector, it's just very straightforward. You use this function numpy.denel.solve. So the difficulty is just creating the matrix. Right. So once you create the matrix, you just do, do this function. And then once you have the function, you'll have the coefficients. And then you'll have to plot the solution. Now to plot the solution, you'll have to plot all of these functions on the different intervals. Now, you should make all the pieces have the same color. If you don't uh, specify the color of your plot, then it will do different uh, colors for each interval. So once you have that, uh, once you have your plot, you should be able to, to estimate the integral of the function over the entire interval. And he talks about this in his discussion. And you do this by finding the sum of the values of the integrals for each interval. Now how do you do that? Well, uh, if, you, if you have this integral here, you have a formula for the integral from x, xi to xi plus 1 of this in terms of a, b, and c, uh, and, and the two endpoints. Uh, you, you would integrate this. You would integrate this just on pencil and paper. Right? You know how to integrate x squared. You know how to integrate x. You know how to integrate a constant. So you get a formula for the integral on each interval in terms of the endpoints and the coefficients. And since you have the endpoints and the coefficients, you should be able to evaluate this. Uh, and that's it. Simple as pie. Right. 
So, uh, like I said, I think the big challenges will be to construct the matrix. It may be a, uh, uh, to, to do the plot. Uh, well, you should be able to, uh, once you're able to do the plot on one interval, the other two intervals will just be the same. You'll just have to do a loop to do that. And same here. For part B, you're going to need a loop because you'll want to estimate the integral on each interval, and you'll have to pass through n intervals. All right. So, um, one thing I could do is just demonstrate the stack. So let's see if we if I could do something like this. So if I so let's see what did I say to make the loop through? Here the loop was through. So we have n. All right. So I would create my my matrix uh, a mix. Let's see what we do here. So I say a mix equals n p dot zeros, and then here we would want to do um, three times n, three times n, and then we're going to do what? And then of course you're going to want your b vector also. Do our loop, so it's going to be um, a four I, I range of n, and then we would do if we're going to do the rows one by one, we would be doing uh, a mix. The first row, uh, the i row, would be i i. Here I'm just going to do something simple. This is not correct, but I'm just going to put something simple like this. All right, so that would be the first block. And then I could do the second block. Actually, I don't need vStack. I can just, I don't need vStack at all. What I do is I define my, vec my matrix and then I fill it in as I go along. So J J I in, in range of n. So this would be the second block of rows. So in this case, if when I'm making the second block of rows, the first row in the second block would have index n. So I'd have a mix of i i plus of sorry J J plus n equal, and then this would be a colon, and then here I would have, I don't know, maybe I can just do um, jj squared. Okay. I'm just putting something in just to show you how you could fill a matrix. Then the third block of rows would be similar. I might as well copy, I might as well copy and paste. This would be the third block of rows. And then here I have kk. Again, I'm just showing you how to put together the matrix here. This would be KK plus 2N. And then here I could do something else, KK cube, why not? All right, now this matrix is going to be too big, so I'm going to make it smaller. Let's just make this equal to uh, 4. Okay. And then let's just see what, what A mix looks like. And of course, I didn't do b. I didn't do bvec, but you'd also do something about bvec, bvec here. Uh, you'd also fill in bvec in a similar way. Okay. So let's see if I screwed up or it worked. All right. There you go. All right. So beautiful matrix. Of course, yours is going to be somewhat more complicated because you'll have to have separate statements for the a coefficients, the b coefficients, and the c coefficients in each. Uh, for each uh, equation. But that's the general idea. Uh, so, so your code will kind of look like this, but with more details. And of course, you'll also have the plot stuff afterwards. Um, okay, any questions? And this is, in, this is in your Google Drive, so you should have this. Are you still with me? Okay. All right. So, uh, Dr. Thrawn, yes. Can you uh, share that sample code that you gave with us, or did you record this video? So 
I recorded the video. Let me make sure it's being recorded. Yes, it is recording. I recorded the video, so you can you'll have that access to that. I'll put that up. I'll put that up um, afterwards. Um, okay. All right. Any other questions? Um, okay, so the last thing, the second thing I wanted to do was talk a little bit about integration. Now, there are a couple of techniques that are talked about in this chapter. First is trapezoid rule, uh, which you saw in Calc 1 or Calc 2, I don't know which Calc, but you've seen trapezoid rule. And you may also have seen Simpson's rule. Since this rule is sort of similar to quadratic splines, you're dividing the function into quadratic pieces, but it's not quite the same. Uh, then there's uh, this other rule that you probably haven't seen called Gauss interpolation, which is really very powerful. And uh, let's see if I can go there. I think I have it downloaded on my... Uh, yeah, here it is. I do have it here. Is it going to come up? There we go. All right. So this is quite an amazing innovation that with just two points, you can evaluate an integral on an interval extremely accurately just by knowing two points of the function. But you need to have the right two points. You can't just do any two points. So how does this work? Just to go over this briefly. All right. So, uh, as I said, this the subject of this chapter is integration. So, so the general integration problem is you have a function, and you have an interval, and you want to evaluate the inter integral. The integral on the interval. Right. So you, you, you're familiar with the fact that the integral is like the area under the curve. Now, when you did trapezoid rule, essentially what you did was you took the value of the function at both endpoints and you took a linear combination of those two function values. But why choose the endpoints? Why not choose points in the middle? Uh, maybe you can get a better result. You have several, you have a choice of which points you're going to use. Also, if you remember, when you did trapezoid rule on more than two points, you had coefficients. So you have a choice of points, and you have a choice of coefficients. And the coefficients are called weights. So let's go down there. And see that. So in, with trapezoid rule, the points were the endpoints, A and B. And the weights were B minus A over 2. All right. But Gauss said, well, why use the endpoints and why use these weights? How about use a different set of points? So let's try a different formula. C1 times f of x1 plus C2 times f of x2. And you get to choose C1, x1, C2, and f, x2. Now, how are you going to choose them? Well, you want to choose them to be able to integrate a function exactly. Now, uh, we know that we, we've seen from Taylor series that uh, the that you can approximate functions with polynomials. So the higher order polynomial I can approximate with this function, the better. Right. Now, uh, in trapezoid rule can actually exactly integrate a linear function. But if you apply it to a quadratic function, you won't get an exact answer. Now, the amazing thing here is that if you choose your weights and your points correctly, you can correctly evaluate a cubic 
integral with just two points. Now, why cubic? Well, here you actually have four unknowns. You have the two weights and you have the two points. So if you have four unknowns, uh, that means you have four different values you can set. So that gives you four equations. And if you have four, four equations, that means you can determine four unknown coefficients. And a cubic has four unknown coefficients. So when I have four equations, I can get four equations in these four unknown coefficients. So just to see briefly how that works, if I take an arbitrary cubic that has four coefficients on this interval from A to B, now this A has nothing to do with these coefficients, right? This is just the endpoint, and these are the coefficients. Here you evaluate the integral. So this is the exact integral of a cubic. And we want to make sure that this value is obtained using these weights and these function values. So we want this value here to always equal this combination. We want to choose C1, C2, X1, and X2 so that this expression is equal to this expression. Okay. Okay. All right. Just a second here. I have to do some measures. Just give me one second. Almost there. All right. So where do we go from here? Whoops. Okay. So so here here we go here. So we want, so here you just rearrange those two parts and express them so that we have linear combinations where each term is multiplying a0, a1, a2, a3. Now we want this to work for every possible value of a0, a1, a2, and a3. Right? So that means that we have to, that all the coefficients have to be equal. b minus a has to be c1 plus c2 b squared minus a squared over 2 has to be equal to this, uh, b cubed minus a cubed over 3 has to be equal to this, and so on. Right. So you set these equal. So four equations, four unknowns. Your four unknowns are the c1, c2, x1, x2. Easy, right? Not so easy. Problem is that these are nonlinear equations. So it's not so easy to solve. Right. And he goes through and solves this for this special case of two points. All right? And he gets some he gets some points and he gets some weights. So you can read through that. Right? Now that's nice as far as it goes. But sometimes you want integrals even more accurately. So here this in in this derivation he uses two points. Couldn't you get more accuracy with more points? And the answer is yes. And he talks about that, but he doesn't prove it. Because if you had more points, you'd have more nonlinear equations, which are a beast to solve. Right? So here he says, you can have higher point quadrature formulas. But he doesn't explain where they come from. And uh, so I want to explain where they come from. And uh, this may be uh, a little bit high level, but I think you should have some exposure to this, these kinds of arguments uh, to show you where where math goes. Uh, so uh, uh, I know this is the first time you've seen you're seeing this. So it's not so I'm sure a lot will pass over your head, but just try to get the general idea of the argument. 
And then if you're interested, you can go back. Now, actually, this is not going to be necessary for any of the homework that you do. But like I said, I think it's, uh, it's good for you to see uh, kind of how, how higher mathematics works, uh, kind of going beyond the, uh, go, going beyond um, uh, taking pieces from what you know and, and improving it. And this actually uses a lot of linear algebra. So if you have, haven't had linear algebra, this will be uh, a little bit of a stretch. But, uh, I'm not, but uh, um, I, I've said many times, I don't know how many times in this course, but, but linear algebra really is the fundamental mathematics for, for, higher, for modern higher mathematics. So the more exposure you get to linear algebra, the better. All right, so let me read through this. So this is also in your Google Drive. So, uh, so I call this deriving Gauss quadrature the right way. The quadrature just means integration method, if you're wondering what that means. Okay, so our numerical analysis test does, does a good job of showing how to get the points and weights for Gauss quadrature in a simple case. It doesn't do it in general because it requires some linear algebra. So I'll, I'll give the general derivation. So here's the general Gauss quadrature formula. The idea is you approximate an integral as the sum of weights times function values. Okay. So the WNs are called the weights. And the alpha ends are the Gauss points. Actually, you probably it would be better to call them Lagrange points, but uh, we just have to call them something. But but uh, you saw the idea I did with two points. We're going to generalize that to n points. So with this formula, it's possible to exactly evaluate the integral of a polynomial of degree two n minus one. Okay, very high degree polynomial. All right, with two points, you got two times two minus one, which is three. With three points, you get a fifth order. Fifth order. So uh, this is almost double the, the polynomial degree that can be done exactly. I shouldn't have said with Lagrange interpolation. Well, yes, with Lagrange interpolation. Lagrange interpolation cannot do nearly this well. Uh, so the Lagrange interpolation, remember, you, you, you can only, if you have uh, n points, you ha have degree n minus 1. So uh, this is much, much better. All right, the key is finding the Gauss points which are not ev evenly spaced. Should be which and not with. These must be chosen very precisely. The numerical analysis book sets up a bunch of nonlinear equations. But there's no general method for solving nonlinear equations. But it turns out there is a systematic way to determine the Gauss points. And it's kind of fancy. All right. So first of all, suppose there is a polynomial of degree n that satisfies these conditions. The integral of p of x times x to the n from minus 1 to 1 is equal to 0. All right. So I should say that in this discussion, I'm going to specialize to integration from minus 1 to 1. Now, you might say that's only a special case, but you can get a general integral from a to b and turn it into an integral from minus 1 to 1 using change of variable. And that's something you've also seen in basic calculus. Um, uh, but so if I solve this problem of integrating from minus 1 to 1, I can use that solution to solve for a general integral. So suppose there is a polynomial that satisfies these conditions. Uh, so, uh, so at this point, just assume that such a polynomial exists. Right? So in, in fact, to do this requires linear algebra. Uh, these, uh, I, just for those who have some background, these are actually, you consider polynomials as vectors. And this integral is an inner product. And here you're saying that this vector x to the n is orthogonal to this polynomial here. So you're saying that this polynomial p of x is orthogonal to these n polynomials. So if you didn't catch that, no problem. But uh, that's, that's really where the background comes from. All right. Now if I do have such a polynomial, 
then any polynomial f of x can be written as f of x equals q of x, p of x, plus r of x. Right? So this is just long division. Right? I can illustrate that on my one note here, that if I have, for instance, if I have, if I do some example, I can say, let's say f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 3x cubed plus 2x squared plus x minus 1. And then let's just say my, what was the other one? Uh, p of x. Let's say p of x. Let's now make it simple for myself. I'll say x cubed minus 2. Right? Now, if I want to write, I want to write f of x is equal to p of x, q of x, plus r of x. As I said, this is just long division. So I would take my f of x, which is x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 2, no, it's 3x cubed plus 2x squared plus x minus 1. And I just do long division by x cubed minus 2. Okay. So you can see that it comes in x times, so I'd have minus x to the fourth, and this is going to be plus 2x cubed. So that's going to give me minus x cubed plus 2x squared plus x minus 1. And then here I'm going to have minus 1. Okay. So this is going to give me minus x cubed plus 2x squared plus x minus 1. So here I get, uh, sorry, there's no plus x minus 1. Okay. And uh, it looks like I get 4x squared plus x minus 1. So I can write my polynomial f of x is equal to x cubed minus 2, and here's the quotient, x minus 1, plus 4x squared plus x minus 1. Right? So this is my q of x, and this is my r of x. This is just ordinary, it's just long division, but with polynomials. Okay. And notice that the degree of this is less than 3, and the degree of this is also less than 3. So that's what's going on here. Uh, when I, I can write any polynomial uh, as in this way. All right. So r of x has degree n minus 1 or less. q of x and r of x can be found by dividing f of x by p of x. q of x is the quotient, r of x is the remainder. So that's what I just showed you. So let's suppose that f of x has degree 2n minus 1 or less. Then qx, q of x also has degree n minus 1. So I can write q of x in this way. All right. So q of x is a polynomial. The degree of the polynomial is n minus 1. So I can rewrite okay. So I can rewrite the integral so it looks like the audio is bad, but I do have the recording. Okay. So, uh, so, it, so it follows that the integral of f is the integral of q of, of, q of x, p of x, plus r of x. Now remember, q of x has this form. So I can substitute q of x for this polynomial expression. And that should be p of x, not b of x. Sorry, that's a p of x. I have to correct that. Right. Then I expand this first part out. And then notice I have these products here. I have these expressions that I already know are 0. Because I had this condition that x to the power times p of x is equal to 0. I have this condition. So what's happened is I started with my f that has degree 2n minus 1. And the first part goes to 0. All the first part, all the first n terms in the interval give me 0. 
Amazing. And I only have to integrate the remainder. Okay. Right. Now we can do even more. So we, I've reduced the problem to a much simpler problem, but we can do even more. I want to find this integral without actually computing the, re the remainder. So the remainder will be also a degree n minus 1 polynomial. So the integral of the remainder can be written this way. I just expanded out the terms. And I integrated, uh, uh, I integrated term by term. Right. And then uh, each term, for, in, for instance, this integral from minus 1 to 1 of 1, that's easy enough. If you integral from minus 1 to 1 of, of x, that's going to be uh, x squared over 2. So you can work out that the formula will be here. Now, actually, the integral of minus 1 to 1 of x is going to be 0 because it's an odd function, and this interval straddles, this is straddles 0. So if you work out all of these integrals, Then you will get, then then you will get um, um, a a bunch of uh, integral values. So e each term here ha is a coefficient of r. So I can write this as an inner product between two vectors. It's dot product coefficient times value of r. So the last thing we have to do is find these coefficients. So we go back to the quotient form for f of x. So suppose p of x has n real roots, a1 through an, alpha 1 through alpha n. And these are going to be your Gauss points. Gauss points are the roots of a n minus 1 degree polynomial. Right. Then you have, then we can plug in f at this case. And we have these, we have these uh, values. So this gives us n linear equations for the roots. Uh, f of alpha 1 equals here. Now this is linear in the, in the roots because the coefficients are linear. The alphas are nonlinear, but the roots are linear. So I have, I have n equations in n unknowns for the different roots. I'm, I'm sorry, no, the roots are given me, but for the, but for the, um, let's see, what do I want? For the R's, for the values of R, I have this equation here. So I'm trying to solve for the values of R. So I can get the values of R as a matrix times the values of the function at these n roots. And once I do that, I can get my integral. And the integral of r is just the integral of f. Okay. So notice what I have here. I have the function values. And I have the inner product of that with this vector. This is actually going to be a, a row vector. It's this row vector times this matrix, so it's going to be a row vector. So I can write these as the weights. These are the weights in my Gauss interpolation. All right. So I finally get my integral as weights times function values. Now, all this depended on finding a polynomial of degree n that has n roots. And these po and polynomials do exist, and they're called Lagrange polynomials. And they can be found using vector space methods. And here's some fancy language that you may or may not know, depending on how much linear algebra you have. Okay. So to summarize, I just want to say that get, getting Gauss quadrature does uh, depend on knowing properties of polynomials that come from applying vector space methods to polynomials. Which shows the uh, amazing cosmopolitan nature of mathematics, that you use linear algebra, which seems to have nothing to do with polynomials, 
and you use that, get weights and points that gives you an integral. Okay, well, I'll post this recording, and those of you who signed off, uh, we, uh, you can still watch the recording. Okay.